left. We'll have student athlete availability in those areas as well. If you're out in the hallway, come in, feel free to grab a seat. We'll have Coach Painter in just a few moments. If you're gonna join us as a guest for the news conference today, let's keep it over on the right side of the room to your right. Let's stay in the right side section. Thanks guys. That's a good spot. That is not the right side section. If you're joining us here in the main interview room, please take a moment to silence your cell phone. A reminder, no flash photography in the main interview room. No video recording devices. That includes mobile phones, camera phones, handheld cameras, mini cameras. You can't go live on social media in the main interview room either. We'll have transcripts almost immediately after the question and answer session and video is available to download as well. As well as the video that's going live over satellite right now and on YouTube. Hi, Gene. Morning, Mike. It's like you can't, you have to call a shotgun when you see the car. <laughs> you can't call a shotgun now. Yeah, in this case, the train, the car, but you know, whatever, however you want to. But we do, we have a half hour, so we'll, I think we'll be able to get some good questions in. We do far, uh, you know, we do a lot in, when we have eight minutes, right, everybody? So we keep it moving. Microphone attendants are here. When you have a question for coach, you can raise your hand and we'll send the microphone attendant to you, recognize you, and then state your name and media outlet before you present your question. That's for the benefit not only of those in the room, but for the benefit of people that are watching on satellite or on YouTube. Makes it more of a complete presentation. I'm sorry? Yeah, slightly different, yeah. A little bit more. No face off for this one. And it'll also, it'll also be on time. I have one in a few weeks, I'm in Fresno. Uh, Jose Ramirez and Virgil Ortiz against Delorme, and I can't remember who Ramirez's opponent is. Virgil Ortiz fights Delorme. Yeah, Sunshine State, gorgeous. Again, we'll have Coach Painter in just a few minutes, and then partway through this 30-minute press conference, Zach Eady will join us, as well as Mason Gillis. After this news conference concludes, the Purdue locker room will open up. Student athletes will be available there, and we'll have the five projected starters in the breakout area. That's to your left and my right. This afternoon, we'll do it all over again with UConn. Now you're back in my office.
Coach Painter has arrived. Good morning. Nice to see you again. That means we're, we keep it rolling. Yes, sir. See, that complies. That's good. We're now joined by Purdue head coach Matt Painter. Midway through this 30-minute question and answer session, we'll be joined by Zach Eady and Mason Gillis. Coach, would you like to tell us how things are going today so far? And then we'll start taking questions. Yeah, obviously, um, you know, it's a quick, a little bit quicker turnaround for us, so for everybody. Um, but just, you know, watching the game last night and watching a little bit of tape and just trying to talk to as many people as, as possible. Um, you know, the most important team is your team. I think anybody would say that at this point. But um, UConn is a very, very good basketball team, very good defensively, run a lot of really good stuff offensively, probably going to steal a couple things. Uh, I'm going to steal a couple things um, for next year. But um, he's just done a phenomenal job, you know, to, to win the national championship and then to be back in this position. I think there's a lot of things that come with ultimate success that's hard to do what they've been able to do and to be able to piece a team together and be able to compete and win multiple championships in their conference, in the tournament, and to keep that focus in, in the way they've won. You know, um, you know, there's been some teams that have hung in there with them and then they've separated from them. And there's been some other teams that have just gotten flat out blitzed. And, and so it's, um, you know, you have to be on your P's and Q's. You got to take care of the basketball. You got to be able to rebound. You got to be able to be good in transition. Um, if you take bad shots and you turn the ball over, you're, you're in deep trouble. It's a quick two or a quick three um, for them. They're probably the best I've seen um, in a long, long time in being able to take your mistake and, and make you pay for it. At times when you make mistakes, other teams, they're probably going to make you pay, but it's just not automatic. It just seems once that happens, it's it, it's automatic. So um, you just you know can't can't have those type of turnovers and those types of bad shots. Um, then you got to be able to guard them. You know, if you do those things, you got a chance. It doesn't guarantee success. You got a chance, but if you don't, you know you, you don't have a chance. Our first question, coach, is going to come to the right side of the room. I think that's Brian under the cap. Hey, Matt, Brian Hamilton from the Athletic. In terms of personnel and roster construction, you look at you guys, UConn, then go back to like Kansas, Virginia, Villanova. What have we learned, or what should we have learned, wins and works these days? Right. Um, I, I think everybody is in a, a different uh, situation. I think the landscape is what it is, but I think first and foremost, can you recruit nationally? Can you recruit your area? Like sometimes when you take a job, everybody always says, oh, we're going to recruit our backyard. But if your backyard is not very fertile and you don't have a lot of players there, like what are you really supposed to do? Just take the best players that aren't quite good enough. So when you're an elite school and you've put yourself in a position like a UConn or a Kansas who's done it for many, many years, you know, it, you can get involved with a lot of people. You know, what – what we've been able to do, you know, through our losses in recruiting is understand, you know, who we can get and who we can't get and then just be smarter about it. And then we've really recruited towards the production and the functionality of our system and what, we, what we're trying to do. Now, with that being said, you still have to be able to get your guys, right? You got to have Braden Smith, got to have Fletcher Lawyer, got to have obviously Zach Eady got to have Biggie Swan again. You got to have Carson Edwards. Then that's when role definition is so important. So a lot of people that are picking out of the portal and, and doing that, they're trying to get the most talented guys if they're getting multiple guys. So if you say someone's got to get six or seven guys, there's no way six or seven guys are going to be successful. It's impossible, right? But if you're in our situation where you got to get a guy or two, you know, Cam Spencer is a great example. You know, you're blending in to what they already had, and then what he brings fits what they do, especially how tough he is, 
how you know how he has a great feel, how he understands offensively. So that's a little bit different than somebody just going into the spring and then their you know their roster management is two thirds of their team, right? And you, you and, and we've always seen that before this with when somebody gets a new job. So now if you get a new job in this landscape, you know, you could sign 13 people, right? And, and, and so that's, that's a whole lot different. So it kind of depends on who you are, where you're at, who you can get, who you can't get. Um, and what is, is tough is name, image, and likeness wasn't supposed to be put in place for whoever's got the most money gets the best players. But if you kind of want to be truthful about what's going on, and the, the part of our business that stinks, that was happening before. So now those teams that were doing that before now get to do it through name, image, and likeness, and it's a double whammy because they're not just getting their name, image, and likeness money. They're getting their money that they were getting before that was illegal. So the people that do it the right way, you know, you can get mad about it all you want, but you need to keep your focus on yourself. So that's what we've tried to do, keep our focus on ourselves. and if that's what you want to do, like, good for you. We can still go get good basketball players, mesh them together, and have a good product. We have about 11 questions in the queue right now. Let's go up front to the left. Dan? Yeah, hey, Matt. Uh, Dan Wolfman, USA Today. You know, as much as you have to talk about and live in and and in some ways get defined by tough tournament losses, how do you as a coach, you know, sort of keep focus on just being good every year and the value in right. in what your program has has done year after year. Right. Just try to keep working. Try to be honest about your mistakes. Try to be honest about um, just everything. You know, it's an inexact science, you know, at times, especially from a recruiting standpoint. But, you know, learn from, you know, your tough losses and don't run from them and face them. And so that's what we've tried to do. You know, we've been to that second weekend a lot, but we haven't been able to get through it. We only got to the Elite Eight once before this. And so, um, you know, just keep plugging, you know, feel good about like what you're doing, feel good about your convictions. And when it gets right down to the game, our tough losses the last four years, don't turn the basketball over. Don't go four for 22 from three um, or whatever those numbers are like, you know, you know, you, but I know this, if we don't turn the basketball over and we still go four for 22 or whatever those numbers exactly are, we're, we're probably going to win those games. So like last night was a, was an outlier game for us. You know, we had high level um, turnovers, but we went 10 for 25 from three and we still established Zach Eady, even though he didn't have like, like an unbelievable game for him. You know, those numbers are, are very average, you know, you know, for him, they're not average for everybody else. But yeah, just trying to do those things and, uh, you know, stay functional in what we're doing. Second row, left side. Hey, Coach, Claire Hanna with TSN. I'm sure you're trying to keep a lot of consistency in your prep as you prepare for this game, but have you noticed a different energy or vibe from your players as you're on the verge of this national championship um, game? Not really. Um, it's, you know, obviously it's a quick turnaround. So, like, when you're, you know, you go to your post-game meal, you know, you go to breakfast, you watch film, and here we are. So it's not a lot of time in terms of what we're doing. Um, you know, they, they understand what we're up against. They understand we haven't played anybody like UConn. They're, they're not fools. We have cable where we're from. So, like, we're, we're very familiar. I think that's the number one thing of, you know, not fearing your opponent but respecting your opponent. We have a lot of respect for UConn. They have great individual players. They have a great coach. Um, and, and, and so understand it. Like, absorb that. Take that in. And, uh, you know, that, that's where you have to start. But we, we've played great teams all year. And just like when we dive into the personnel, whether that's Gonzaga, whether that's Tennessee, whether that's Marquette, whether that's Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan State, on down the line, you know, respect your opponent, respect those coaches, respect the players, understand how they've really beat people, how they've really dominated people. And I think the word dominate comes out with UConn, right? They've dominated people. They haven't dominated like the bad teams. They've, they've dominated some great teams. And then with that, how do they go about it and just study it but it's easier to study and, and like look at than it is, you know, you, you gotta be able to do your job. You gotta be able to embrace the physicality, keep them out of transition, keep them off the glass, keep them out of their sets and what they wanna do. Um, you know, it's easy to watch and understand that, but it's, it's very, very hard to do. And that's our challenge. Coach, we'll go to the right side, second row, Chris. Coach Chris Bennett with ESPN. We've talked about like what you learned after last year, getting better at the three, being more athletic, quicker. 
Would you be here today if you didn't have those scars from last year? And if someone had told you you're going to have to go through it in order to get to this place, right. would you have taken that deal? Yeah, to answer your last question, I, I think um, I think to get in this position, you would take it, right? You would say, hey, like, let's, let's take that loss to get here. I'd prefer not to do that, though. Um, the problem with a really tough loss when it ends your season is – you don't have another game. Like when you blow a game on January 16th, you just play on January 21st, you know, and you get that taste out of your mouth, you get it back, like you can, but when you have a loss at the end of the season, you know, you have to sit in it and you have to take it. And, and some of that um, um, is healthy in a sense. You're just, it's why I try to keep, um, you know, our players from going into coaching because there's such a level of misery you know, there's there's so many good things, and I'm so glad I did it because of the relationships. But I don't like, you know, you don't choose how you feel. I always compare it to dreams. Like, you know, why is this person in my dream that doesn't, he shouldn't be here or whatever. You don't pick your dreams. Your dreams are your dreams, but we all understand some of our dreams are nightmares too. And you don't pick those either. And so that piece of it, of being able to have to go to, through it and feel that, I think helps you get on edge helps you to be a little sharper, but um, I think you only need to do it once, though. We've done it multiple times. Um, what was your first question again? I apologize. I, I don't think so. I think, you know, I, when you make a statement like, would we be here without Zach Eady? No. You know, would you be here without Braden Smith? No. And as you start to trickle down as a coach, you realize the importance. I have two guys that didn't play for me last night, um, Caleb First and Ethan Morton and they started for me the year before. And with their attitudes and the way they've handled things and the way they've been professional as young people, we wouldn't be here with them either, without them either. Like, they're, they're a big part of our team, and it pains me that they don't play. It's really hard for me as a person to do that because I wanted to work for each individual. But at the end of the day, I have to make decisions that are best, uh, you know, for Purdue, and it's, and it's also best for circling around Zach and it's in circling around Braden and our, and our core guys and how they do it. We've really went to a more offensive front to where we're putting as much skill out on the court as possible. So I'm very appreciative of those guys and just appreciative of the guys are on our scout team, like people that come to Purdue. They don't come to be on the scout team. They come to play. And then when you don't and then you have to be on the scout team and you have to do those things, man, and, and to be able to swallow your pride and do it and try to help us. Like, you know, I have a lot of respect for that, and I appreciate those guys. Coach, we'll head up front. Gene? Hey, Matt. Gene Wong, The Washington Post. What similarities can you draw from uh, the journey you're on compared to what Virginia did in 2019? Or do you look at it something different because each year and each team have right. their own unique story? No, I, I think that that's actually an accurate narrative. Sometimes people will pick up narratives that, that, that you know, out of thin air instead of doing their work. This, this is actual, the right narrative. Um, the thing I grab from it more than anything is just the humility of Tony Bennett and how he handled it with class. I think anytime you can take it, you know, you gotta be able to take it. You know, when you're a little kid, you know, that was always the line, you know, you know, can, you, know you can dish it out, but you can't take it, right? That's the old saying. Um, and we're all that way as young people. Like, we, you know, we, we can say whatever we want, but then it hurts when it comes back your way, but, you know, use that in a positive spin. But more than anything, what stood out to me was when we had that loss, you know, we joined that club with Virginia and Tony Bennett, and he had just gotten beat, I think, by, by Furman that day. And, you know, you're, you're at a low when you, when you have tough losses like that. And for him to think of us and to think of me and to reach out to me on that day was, you know, that was great. So from just a humanity standpoint, right just like you know there, there there are some good people out there um that are thinking about others even when they're down and out and um once again it's not who you are right it's not who you are it's what you do for a living it means a whole lot but it's not who you are and, and try to keep that in perspective up front and center you see bartley boiler upload rivals matt last year you talked a lot about how your team lost confidence this season it comes to seems to be the opposite regardless of results there's been confidence after losses 
What about your team this year? And then in regards to Braden yesterday, just what did you see from confidence in him and confidence in your team regardless right. of results? Well, I think, you know, through confidence for us, um, I, I think a lot of that gets drawn from how people shoot the basketball, right? I think that's a, not necessarily how they play basketball, but how they shoot the basketball. And I think when you miss shots and you're used to making them and you turn the ball over and you're used to not, and that combination, I think that combination for Braden yesterday was really hard for him to take in. I thought our team did a good job, our staff did a good job of just keeping him positive. He's a big piece of what we do. He runs the show for us. So that was just a great example of not being at your best but still winning a game in a, in a really tough environment versus a tough team. And so, um, yeah, you, you just stay with it. You, you just keep plugging and um, you keep trying to help each other. And now, you know, you, you step up and you have a good game and maybe that other person is, is going to be somebody that was helping you the night before that you have to help. And, you know, just the reciprocity of being a good teammate and, and being a good coach and, um, and understanding that, you know, you're, you're going to have some failure, but sometimes you can build off of that failure and even have more success because of it. By the column over here, Pete. Uh, Matt, Pete Thamel from uh, ESPN. I'm wondering if you could uh, just give us a little X and O insight, compare and contrast on the big man matchup. It's obviously going to be one of the focuses of the game on Monday in terms of Donovan and Zach. And maybe as the second part, reflect a little bit on your philosophy of staying with recruiting and developing big men like Zach when the trends of the game clearly have kind of gone away from that. Right. Yeah. You know, just for us, it's, it's circling the wagons around our best players. You know, if that's Carson Edwards, so be it. You know, when we came three-tenths of a second from going to a Final Four in that game, you know, we didn't play post-up basketball. You know, we, you know, we, we tried to do as much stuff in space, and, and he was so good and dynamic that we just we let it rip. And um, people don't realize with that team that he really struggled in, at the end in the Big Ten, even though we won the Big Ten that year. We really struggled. We got beat in the first round of the Big Ten tournament. Um, he didn't shoot well the last couple games of the season after really shooting well. And then going into the tournament, you know, he became the darling of the tournament. You know, his last three games he made 10, 9, and 8 threes. But going in, you know, we just felt we had a lot of makes coming our way. And it, it could go the other way, right? So we just tried to circle it around our best guys. We've just had a lot of big guys. But we've still had some pretty dynamic guards from Echuan Moore to Jaden Ivey to Carson Edwards. Obviously, we have good guards on this team. Um, but just trying to play through them and their strengths and, and keep building off of that. The one thing I think that we do a better job than most people with it is we make them decision makers. Because if you're going to get the ball a lot, you know, yesterday, like, Zach had some turnovers. And, like, you know, now let's watch those turnovers. Let's look at it. Let's see what they're doing. Let's learn from that. No different than a point guard. You know, Braden had some turnovers yesterday. So let's watch that and see, you know, the mistakes that you're making and then just grow from that. Because – even when you start to have success in certain areas, it's, it can still rear its ugly head. And great teams will, you know, they will enhance that with their pressure or their size or their length. But, you know, both players are really good. I, I think the important piece of it also is not to neglect who UConn brings off the bench too. Because John's he's a really good player. You know, their backup is a really good player. He, you know, he, he gets out in ball screen defense. He's active. He gets great. He does a great job on his flip up dunks. You know, he just they have a they have a superb system. I love their system. I love what they do. Um, they have purpose in what they do on both ends. But they everybody defends on that team. You know, like you're not allowed to play, right? If you can't guard, you can't play. So it's like one of those deals, like old school. And um, but no, like like Klingon is really good. Like, you know, he changes the game defensively, but offensively he's a good player too. You know, he, but he, he's, he's just going to keep coming. He's going to be a fabulous player. He's got 15 to 20 years in front of him. Um, but don't take anything away from other guys on that front line because they're all good players. On the right side, Eddie. Hey, Coach, uh, Eddie Pels with AP. I, we're, I know we've, you've heard you talk a lot about we're kind of more in an instant gratification world of college sports. Was there a a time when you either you, you as a kid or a player or as a coach where you, where you just realize like it, it's just going to I can live with myself more if I'm honest with players as opposed to yeah. telling them whatever they want to get them over here. Yeah, no no question about it. Like I would 
like break down things and my assistants would like be like if you keep going this route we'll have nobody on our team like your honesty is like killing us like and that was about 10 12 years ago and I just said yeah but when we get them it's easier to coach them you know and so just like like be a truth teller I, I think there's a lot of people out there that understand that and feel that but I just put the caveat on it and the guys that cover us all the time has heard it a hundred times but just if you become one of our top two or three scorers here's my vision for you if you don't then you're going to have to be able, from a role definition standpoint, fit around those guys offensively. So what happens in recruiting is guy, you can have a two-year relationship and you can talk about your role, and not one time do they talk about defense. Pretty important part of the game, huh? So if you get there and you can't handle pressure and you can't play without turning it over because you handle pressure by just shooting before and then you can't guard your man or you don't even know like what county he's in, you know, it's going to be really hard to play you on a, on a really good college basketball team. So you'll see, like, talented guys. That's why you see a lot of talented one-and-done guys. The guys that are one-and-done that come in that are like Carmelo Anthony, like, they are rare. He functional, win a national championship. Like, that is hard. A lot of the one-and-done guys, like, on their talent, like, they get there, and now it's really hard for them because now they're being asked to do some things that they've never had to do. You see it a lot in the portal. You'll, you'll go get a low, mid, low to mid-major player that's averaged 20 points somewhere, and he's going to come to your place. If he can stay in that role and average 20 points, he can have a little bit more rope, a little bit more freedom, because that's what a leading scorer gets. You don't like to say that, but that's just the truth. You know, it's just, just the way it is. You're going to be able to play through your mistakes more when you can go get us 20. But if that guy that averaged 20 at that level now comes to a high level and now he's going to average like four to ten points for you, like now all the things you harp on is what the previous coach harped on, but he just kept him in the game because he needed his 20 points. Now I don't need some joker that's averaging five points for me to get beat back door on two different plays. It's like, hey, man, get him out of there. Whereas the guy who gets beat back door that, you know, averages 25, you're like, hey, man, can we not get beat back door while he's running back down the court? Like, you know, so um, that, that is um, the contradiction of coaching, right? That's just, it's just the way it is. But we all search for a role. That's what we want. Like nobody says, hey, man, I hope I can come to your place and play about 10 minutes and set screens and rebound. Like, you know what I mean? That'd be cool, you know. We'd like to welcome to the dais at this time Mason Gillis and Fletcher Lawyer will join us from Purdue as well. Let's take a question in the Stay third row, Fletch. second seat in. Uh, Matt Adi Joseph, CBS Sports. What what do you see as the uh, the backcourt size disadvantage that your team has in this championship game with Castle and Newman um, versus Braden and Lance? Yeah. How do you how do you want to play into that? Do you, does that change your strategy at all? Yeah. Well, I think we have a disadvantage if they make poor decisions. I don't think it's a disadvantage if we make good decisions. You know, they swarm you, they get into you, they make it difficult on you. Don't put yourself in di difficult scenarios. Take care of the basketball, run our stuff, you know, make good decisions. They, those guys are really good at pressure. And Stephen Castle, on down the line, you know, when they sub, they're good. Like all those guys can pressure, take care of the basketball, make good decisions, run what we've called, and, and stick with that. If, if we do those things, you know, you'll have success. What they do a great job of is when blood's in the water. When you show weakness or you turn your back on pressure or you dribble in place, um, you know, you leave your feet, you don't play on two feet, those guys are the best in the business. They, they will make you pay. And like I said earlier, that's, that's two or three points at the end, at the other end of the court. So I think that's important for us, and that's our challenge. Just handle pressure, take care of the basketball, make good decisions. Because they, they'll get into you, and they're solid, but they're just waiting for you to do something stupid. Don't do something stupid. Back left, Dana. Hold the microphone out, please, so Dana can take it. Thank you. Uh, Dana O'Neill at The Athletic. Matt, you talked about the turnovers. I guess, you know, the glass half empty is that they turned it over the glass half full as you got through it. Um, just... The evolution of this team's composure this season, how has it worked out and kind of where are they in it, do you think? Right. I, I thought we did a good job um, of kind of playing through it. Um, we offset it by going 10 for 25 from three. So you throw a five for 25 on top of that, you get beat. 
and that's where we've lost in the past. We've lost in the past because of high turnovers, high volume of threes, and low percentage. We can take a high volume of threes in a low percentage and then have eight turnovers and still win a game, but we can't do the three for 23 in the 17 turnovers. That's a recipe for disaster. So, like, they understand that. I've, I've talked those numbers to them the whole season, but it's also the functionality of play, like being able to handle someone's pressure, being able to take care of the basketball. And, you know, we had a couple elementary turnovers. Um, we overdid our dribbling a couple times. We, our, our spacing wasn't good. In a couple of those scenarios, that was on me in terms of our post action and what we do when the ball goes inside. Um, but, like, we've played, you know, the, this whole season, and we, we've seen a lot of different looks. I think this is the this is the biggest challenge for us on the biggest stage, and that's what you want. Like you know, you, you want to be able to do that, and uh, like, like I said earlier, just being functional in what we do is the most important. Up front on the left side, Myron. You know, Matt, in the climate where a lot of bigs want to be versatile, don't want to be called centers, how hard is it to find guys like Zach Eady in the current climate? Yeah, it, it's very difficult because most big guys that are that size aren't very good at basketball. You know, if you go look at the numbers across the board, you know, like how many other players are, are good at 7 4, 300, but there's not very many of them out there, period. You know, so, you know, we, we, we scour the earth for size. You know, we, we, we try to go out there and get it because it's, it's proven. Um, if you can work with it, I think we have a, a great assistant in Brandon Brantley that's done a great job with those guys that, that gives a lot of time and film and individual instruction. And then you got to you got to offset it with skill. So like both of these guys to my right, you know, just didn't come to Purdue and learn how to shoot. Like these guys were great shooters before. They're 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 high. so if you can get high level competitors that are skilled, both of these guys are very very competitive, but they're also maniacal in their work. So it's not something I got to check on because I found out that's who they are no matter what. So like if they would have went to another school, they would still work on their game. Right, a lot of times people say, hey, "Through our development, and we did this, and we did this." And I think that's bullshit. You know, a lot of times, like these guys did it. Like, give them credit. It's a player's game. You know, and I think that's an important piece to really embrace in coaching. I'm yet to see somebody come up here and get interviewed all the time with bad players. Right. Right. It's a, it's a player's game, man. These guys are great players. They're good, but we also have to piece it together. You know, they sacrifice too. Like, they can do more than they actually do, but they're playing with a guy that now they, they get role definition. So Fletch might get 12 rips at it. He might get six. You know, Mason has games where he shoots the ball two or three times. Sometimes he shoots the ball seven or eight times. What it, you know, if you want to let him play one-on-one, -on -one, we'll play one-on-one. -on -one. If you don't, then we're going to pass the ball. But they need to pass the basketball too, and they pass it way more than he does, and rightfully so. But, like, that's just – it's in a system – that they know that they can flourish in and we feel that they can flourish in. Now, when he moves and we change, like how will that, you know, you know that, that, that's the difference. But um, we won games before that too. We have a number of questions for Coach Painter in only a few more minutes, but we do need to get one in for the student athletes from Purdue. If you have a question for Mason, we'll go to Zach in the center of the room. Or Fletcher. Zach Brazil in your post. For either of the player, you obviously have played a lot of very good teams this year. Is there anyone you've played that you would say is comparable to UConn, or are they in a class by themselves in terms of your opponents this year? Mason first, please, then Fletcher. Um, I don't know necessarily how to classify them in their own kind of class, but they won the national championship last year. They deserve the respect that they've gotten, and we've done our work to get here. They've done their work to get here. And the thing about the game that we have Monday is that it's two great programs, two great cultures, two great coaches going at it, and the players are going to do their best. That's what we can do. We don't necessarily worry about comparing them to other teams. It's just we have to do our job. Fletcher. Yeah, kind of like Mason said, you don't really compare them. You kind of compare your uh, what you're going to bring to the table, how you're going to get ready to play. Uh, you got to get ready as if it's to win the Big Ten, as if it's uh, – if it's to win the national championship, bigger stage. So just getting ourselves ready. Obviously, they're a great team. They made it here uh, second year in a row. That's very impressive. And uh, so giving them the respect, but making sure we're ready to go. This will be the final question for this session to the left. Uh, Israel Schumann from the Purdue Exponent. Matt, you brought in a new um, <clears throat> strength and conditioning coach a couple years ago, Jason Cabo. Um, 
what did what did he bring you know in terms of impact and what has he kind of changed with the way you guys prepare physically yeah. and then Mason can also weigh in on this yeah, no he's done a, a, a great job you know he has got good rapport with our guys um, very experienced you know been in the background has worked with a lot of high level college guys high level pros being at UNLV you know a few NBA players go through Vegas in, in the offseason guys I don't know if you knew that um, but like he's worked with a lot of different people um, at a very, very high level. These guys can speak on it. I can let Mason speak on it because they work directly with them. And, uh, you know, but more than anything, of, of just having a good rapport with guys and trying to help them in their own situation. There's a lot of things that are similar in what we do with each guy, but there's a lot of differences, right? Like what Zach Eady does and what Fletch does, there's going to be some differences. I think that's the key thing is, is to help each guy you know, improve their strengths and their weaknesses. Sometimes guys just want to dive into what they struggle in when there's some things in the weight room that are strengths, you know, you want to keep enhancing. Go ahead, Mason. You wanted Mason to take that too. Like Coach said, his experience has shown over the two years. I think whenever he first came into our program, he did a good job of learning who we were, learning how to work with us. And like Coach said, everybody's different. And so anytime you're new to a program, you have to learn that. I think he did a good job of going to each of us, talking to each of us, figuring out our weaknesses, figuring, figuring out our strengths, and we've grown with that. Over the course of the two years that he's been with us, he's really been able to isolate what Zach needs to do a couple days before the game to get him feeling the best. He has learned what I need to do, whether that's more on some days, less on some days, um, specific exercises, and things like that. Like Coach talked about, he's been around He's been through things, and it always helps when you've seen things personally. Um, you can't compare anything to real life experience, and him bringing that into our culture uh, it just helps us, helps us grow. Um, and he's a good guy, too. He's able to converse with us outside of the locker room. Um, he's had us over to his house to have food, and so he's done his best, his best to get us here to the national championship. We'd like to thank Mason Fletcher and Coach Painter for joining us here in the main interview room. Mason and Fletcher and other of Purdue's starting five will join us in the breakout area in just a few moments at 1220. That's to my right and your left. The Purdue locker room will be open for other student athlete availability from Purdue starting now. Thank you, Coach. UConn begins at 145, but Purdue will be open from 1220 to 1250 half hour session in the locker room and in the breakout rooms with the student athletes.
could all be late, so we could finish watching the Winter Festival and spend some time with the people.
Good afternoon and welcome back to the main interview room here at State Farm Stadium. In a few moments, we'll be joined by the head coach of the Yukon Huskies, Dan Hurley, along with student athletes Tristan Newton and Cam Spencer. We'll do a 25-minute news conference here. After a certain amount of time, we're going to allow Tristan and Cam to leave the dais, and we'll have a question and answer period with Coach Hurley exclusively. But for the first 10 minutes, it'll be all three, Coach Hurley with Tristan Newton and Cam Spencer. At 2.05, this will all begin from 1.45, it'll go to about 2.10. With the student athletes participating from 145 to 155. At 205, the UConn locker room will open for student athlete availability. And from 205 to 235, concurrently, we'll have breakouts with student athletes. That's in the part of the main interview room to my right, your left. If you're joining us in the main interview room for our question and answer period with Coach Hurley and with Tristan Newton and Cam Spencer, we ask that you please take a moment to silence your cell phone. A reminder, no flash photography during the news conference. The locker room is closed during this session, but will be open again at 2.05, concurrently with student-athlete breakouts from UConn. No video recording devices during this news conference that includes handheld cameras, mini cameras, mobile phones, camera phones, etc. You cannot go live on social media in this room. Again, Coach Hurley, Tristan Newton, and Cam Spencer 
begin our 25-minute news conference at 1.45. Tristan and Cam will leave after the first 10 minutes. Coach Hurley will be here for the remainder of the time. And then once again, open locker room with student athletes and UConn breakouts in the breakout area to my right and your left from 2.05 to 2.35. This news conference will run from 1.45 to 2.10. We had 13 questions in our first 30-minute session this morning. We called Elias. It's a record. The amount of questions per 30-minute session. Highest. To do better, of course, we would need shorter questions and shorter answers. Well, to do more. Not necessarily better. I don't want to qualify it, just quantify it. Did not give short answers or great answers? Short, right. I thought great answers. We did have 27 questions in the queue for 30 minutes. That's unrealistic. Fanta, you're viral with uh, Kuykendall. Just so shows what social media's appetite is for Kuykendall. They want more. That's what they're saying. Was that viral? Kuykendall wasn't happy about the Frisbee situation. What's <laughs> Fudge Did we have a Frisbee? People like Frisbees? Yukon has arrived, no Frisbees. Afternoon, fellas, congrats. Welcome to the big room. Basketball. Hey, Coach. Good. Good to see you. Head Coach Dan Hurley joins us with Tristan Newton and Cam Spencer. This is a 25-minute news conference with student athletes for the first 10. Coach Hurley will ask you to make an opening statement, then we'll take questions for all three. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, deep into the uh, – you know, the, the prep for both of us, uh, you know, just the, uh, you know, basically, a, you know, a day and a half prep, uh, you know, for each other here. So, uh, you know, I think I said this about Marquette during the season, um, you know, playing certain programs. It's, uh, you know, feels like a, you know, privilege because of, uh, you know, what they stand for, how they do it, and, and you know, how good they are. So, uh, you know, to be able to play the national championship versus Purdue, um, you know, and how good they are and how Matt runs things. Uh, it's a real privilege to play them for the championship. Questions for Coach Hurley, Tristan, and Cam. Let's start in the middle of the room with Matt. We're going to use the back left microphone. Dan, good afternoon. Congrats on winning. I'm right here. Congrats on winning uh, National Coach of the Year. Um, I couldn't help but notice you sat down at the dais with a, with a little manila folder. If you could take us into... Uh, where you are with prep, and is that just a typical scouting report? Genu genuinely curious about uh, where you're at right now. Yeah, so, um, you know, immediately after the game, um, you know, after the media was done, you literally, you know, get that tablet as soon as you get on the bus, and I was into, uh, you know, you're into, you're into Purdue on the, on the way back to the hotel. We were able to, 
you know, probably, you know, I, I was able to consume, you know, three games uh, before I went to bed last night. Luke Murray uh, obviously was, was prepping for the winner uh, of that game. So, um, you know, I've been able to, you know, catch, you know, six of their games already. I'll imagine I'll watch, you know, maybe eight. Um, and then that's all kind of the, the analytics, uh, scouting report, uh, some of that type of stuff. We'll go up front on the left side, Fanta. John Fanta, Fox Sports, for Dan and the players. Can you guys reflect on, on how great of a matchup this is for, for men's college basketball? This is one versus two throughout this season. Obviously, Donovan versus Zach, but there's so many other pieces to both these teams. Just what it's like knowing that you're going to step on the floor against this Purdue team tomorrow and, and uh, how big this is, how great this is for the sport, that this is how we end what's been a remarkable season. We'll ask Cam to take that first, then Tristan, then Coach. Yeah, I think it's a great matchup you know, between two teams who have had two great years. Um, obviously, you know, we have a lot of respect for them as a program. You know, they're in national championship for a reason. And, you know, I'm sure people have been waiting to see this one for a while. But, you know, we're, we're locked in and we'll be ready to go. Tristan. Uh, yeah, we've been the two best programs the past two years, uh, us and Purdue. And uh, it's a great match. We're looking forward to it. You know, the coaches are going to, you know, get us well prepared and, and ready to, to have a good game tomorrow. Anything to add, Coach? Yeah, I would just say I'm sure that, uh, you know, Cam endeared himself to their fans uh, while he was in the Big Ten. On the right side, Brian. Brian Hamilton from The Athletic. Uh, Dan, when you look at the way you've constructed your roster this year, last year, the way Purdue's constructed the roster, we go back to you know Kansas, Baylor, Virginia winning titles. What have we learned about what wins, or what should everyone know about what wins to get teams to this level? I, mean, I think all of us should just shut up about it and stop trying to help the people that don't know what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, you, you got to be able to score. Obviously, um, you know, to win a six-game uh, a six-game single elimination tournament. Um, you know, I think that the days of of of, of that kind of the, the rock fight style of play um, in, in modern basketball. I think it's going to be tough to win that way. Um, you know, I think obviously balanced roster. Uh, you know. You know, young players with, with talent that are uh, insulated by, you know, returning players to your program with uh, th that could uphold the, the culture and then strategic, you know, portal um, additions that could put you over the top. Um, but I think it's, you know, the, the roster construction, skill, you know, you know, skilled players that can process the game and, uh, you know, and, and balance in terms of veterans and young players. We'll go up front on the right side. Jacob Saliga, Arizona Varsity. Coach Hurley, your team has done a very good job as a whole with your lineup in terms of crashing the glass as a unit. Playing in the Big East, this, uh, going up against guys such as Joel Soriano, uh, Kalkbrenner, Oso Igodoro. How well did you think that attacking the glass as a team against those great post players are going to help prepare you to go up against a guy like Edie who controls the post as well as he does. Yeah, um, you know, he, he's obviously, you know, you, you may coach or play your whole career and never, you know, coach or play against somebody of his stature. Um, you know, tr truly, a, you know, a giant player. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we're not, you know, we're, we're a pretty physical team, but, you know, we, we more so fly to the ball. Um, you know, and then I think, well, you know, we're, we're disciplined like they are. I mean, they're, they're an excellent rebounding team. We're an excellent rebounding team. We both block out. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the time it just comes down to, uh, uh, you know, tracing that ball and, and uh, you know, who, who's, uh, who's going to make that life or death pursuit to get it. Continuing up front. Casey Bartley, Boiler Upload Rivals. Dan, considering the narrative of Purdue getting here for the first time since 69, you guys are getting back. Are there differences between getting here the first time and doing it again? Um, you know, I, I think. Uh, listen, when you when you, you know, when, when you break through that, that euphoria that you feel when um, you know when you 
when you punch your ticket to the Final Four and just, you know, the bigness of this event, um, uh, just participating in it for, as, a, as, a, as a coach or a player, uh, the experience, um, you know, this setting, uh, you know, the, the, the buses, the police escorts, the 70,000 people in the state. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's an, it's an incredible, um, it's an incredible experience. Um, and it doesn't, uh, you know, uh, the second time you make it feels just as good as the first. Moving over to the left. Second row, second seat. Kyle Tucker with The Athletic. Dan, you've talked, I think you talked in the Big East tournament about needing your jolly, jolly green giant to sort of get nasty. How, how good of a job has he done in this tournament of doing that, and how easy is it to get him in that mindset when the two-time National Player of the Year is on the other side? Yeah. Um, you know, the thing with Donovan is he just uh, he just got he got healthy at the absolute you know, right, right time of the year. And then, you know, in, in a similar way, you know, where like, you know, Steph Castle at the end of his freshman year is now probably playing like a sophomore. You know, you, you've got, you know, Donovan now who has enough experience and enough experience in big spots, um, you know, where, where he's perfectly conditioned. Um, he's healthy. He's confident. Um, and, and he's playing more like a junior player. And, um, you know, he understands the challenges you know that, that he's dealing with. You know, with with Zach Eady, it's uh, it's it's just a it's a unique matchup, uh, and he's played against some outstanding centers and Soriano and Kalkbrenner. Um, but this is a different animal, and, um, and 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 they use him in a much much different way. So uh, it's going to be a heck of a challenge for our front court, for our guards, for our whole team, because it's going to have to take a team effort to to try to slow him down a little bit. Second row, Zach. Zach Brazil, the New York Post. Dan, what can you reflect on just what it's like been like to coach your son and what, like, you remember when he was at finishing high school, like, kind of the thought process, like, you know, about, you know, probably, could, you know, obviously his decision to want to play for you, even though he probably knew he wasn't really going to play. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he was good enough to, he would have been a, you know, Division two, II, Division three player. Um, he could dunk. You know, I could never dunk. I got short arms, um, and I couldn't jump that that high. Um, he humanizes me a little bit. I don't know what he does in the locker room when I'm like, when I'm on like a heater and I'm being completely, it's a complete brutal ass to everybody. Like I don't know if he goes in the locker room and you know endears himself to these guys by crushing me and say, yeah, he's the worst, or if he or if he goes in there and says, you know. Hey guys, he loves you. He just cares. <laughs> I don't really know what's going on back there. Um, I don't know if these guys will tell me either uh, before it's over. But you know, as a coach, you you miss um, you sacrifice a lot, especially at the college level or the NBA level. Um, and oftentimes, your wife and your kids um, you know suffer um, with that time lost. So to be able to get that time back and be together, 11 months a year, and see each other every day, multiple times a day. You know, the highs, the lows of everything we go through um, made up for a lot of time we lost. Dom, is your question for a coach or for the players? For a coach. Okay, well, we'd like to thank Tristan and Cam for joining us. They're going to be part of the breakout session that starts at 2.05. They'll take their place cards to the uh, breakout sessions as well. This is the front left microphone. Question from Dom for Coach. Hey, Dom Amori, Hartford Current. Uh, Dan, you, you've talked quite a bit about how much pressure there is in that first round game. And, uh, you know, you guys kind of went through it and came back and won a championship the next year. Can you imagine what they went through losing the 116 game and doing what they've done? What does it tell you about them and the character that you're going to be facing tomorrow? I mean, I, we could relate, um, and everyone's motivations are different. Uh, but, you know, it was very relatable for, again, the, the, the COVID NCAA tournament, um, you know, I, I like to throw that one out for me. Um, you know, I'll accept responsibility to a degree for that uh, brutal performance. But, you know, that New Mexico State loss and then the Iona game, I mean, we, we felt the heat. I know um, – you know, I, I know that what, what that felt like, and you know, for them, it probably was even even more so uh, than that. 
but um, you know they're, they're such a classy program. Their their culture is as good as anyone. Um, you know they're as well coached as anyone. You know they uh, you you could see they they had a uh, an attitude about them going into this tournament um, throughout the season, where I, I don't think anyone thought that this would be a, a, a similar situation for them. But we I could certainly relate to the pressure they felt. Center of the room toward the right. Coach Riley, uh, Kobe Mosley, USBWA. Um, my question's about Donovan Klingon. Um You talked earlier about this week about Justin Newton and how he's kind of uh, grown as a leader. How do you think Donovan is going as a leader, especially after you guys winning a championship and all these seniors leaving after last year? You, just, you, you learn so much in coaching. and just, um, just when you see how different personalities affect um, you know, just the team vibe, especially when you're going into these big high leverage moments. Um, you know, I think my experience with Donovan and some of the folks we brought in the last couple of years, the Joey Californias and um, the Andre Jacksons, and the, just you just realize how important it is to have people that are alive and, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not zombie-like creatures, you know, they're just like, um, they bring a life to the locker room. They, 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 they've got passion. You, the people that you can lose with, um, and still be able to pick the pieces up because they're just they're good people. They're charismatic, um, and they're 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 just great in the locker room because it's it's a grind. Left side, AP, right there. Dan, uh, David Brandt from the AP. You talked a little bit about Steph Castle a couple minutes ago, but it's, it seems like for a five-star McDonald's All-American guy, he's remarkably low maintenance and, and just wondered how, why he's been able to fit in so well with your roster and how he's grown over these last couple months. I think he told on himself, um, well, I mean, he's got the great parents and uh, Stacy and Quan, they, they keep, they've kept him humble all the way through. Um, in a sport where we, we put these kids on a pedestal, you know, way before they should be. Um, and we, we treat them like they've arrived way before arrival. Um, and they didn't allow that to happen with him. Um, the way he handled the recruiting process, it didn't turn into a fiasco. It didn't go from a, a list of, uh, I've narrowed my list to 20. Now I've narrowed it to 18. Now I've, now 12, now nine, you know, like, <laughs> He was decisive. He watched us practice. He saw our culture. Uh, he wanted to be coached hard. Um, they wanted a, an old school environment uh, for him to be challenged in and to be held accountable. And um, it's uh, it's just been the perfect situation for him because his draft stock uh, is right where they want it to be right now. And he's one big. You you can still do both, um, and everyone could win. <laughs> Center of the room. Amanda Kristovich, front office sports. Uh, just from a big picture perspective, do you feel like UConn could have reached this level of dominance if you hadn't rejoined the Big East a few years ago? Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, we were well on our way, you know, in a similar similar way to what Coach Sampson was doing in the AAC. Um, obviously, going to the Big Twelve is, you know, every, everything's bigger, you know, tougher league. But you know, we. We were recruiting at a very, very high level, um, and, and we would be where we were regardless. I got the best staff in the country. I got one of the biggest brands in college basketball. Uh, it has certainly helped, um, but we, we've also uh, had, a, had a big impact uh, on, uh, on the Big East as well. Left side of the aisle, all the way left. Killian Johnson, <laughs> Sports Illustrated Kids. Coach, as reigning champions, uh, how you've had a target on your back all year. How has that motivated you? I mean, well, number one, my, my biggest motivation, really, for the last two, three weeks is um, I just don't want to deal with the portal shit. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, well, that's why we're trying to win so hard right now is I'm seeing what other people are doing. And it's, it's chaos, and I can hide behind, hey, my season's still going on. Um, Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think we, we've used that like for a lot of the year, we've used the external slights, the perceived slights, uh, all, all those things, the world's against us mentality, 
I, I think that gets you through like the the regular season, Big East grind, January, February, where, where the team's tired and you've got to create these different things. You know, where we really use that motivation external. Everyone's trying to get us. They want what we got. We're the champs. Somebody's going to have to Somebody's going to have to rip this out of our hands. I mean, we, we use that a lot. Um, but once you get to this time of year, you, everything is just – you are who your identity is. The way you play, it, it, it's very automatic, and it just comes down to you know, hoping that it, it, it's uh, hoping that it's your night. Dana, on the left side toward the back. Uh, Dana O'Neill with The Athletic. Dan, you and Matt come at it maybe differently, but you're both pretty strong in your convictions about how you want to do things. Both have taken some heat for it sometimes, perhaps. How do you kind of maintain the courage of that conviction um, as you go through this and the world kind of swirls around you? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think we do have a lot of similarities in terms of, you know, the, 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 the culture and, um, and, and the old school you know, values that we have in terms of the type of people that we recruit and the type of teams we have. Uh, um, you know, so maybe the personalities are a little bit different on the sideline. I wish I had his composure uh, <laughs> at times. Um, and, um, you know, I just think that, you know, we're, 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 we've been involved in the game our whole lives. We were both players. We both played for incredible coaches um, throughout our careers. And I think those coaches that we played for have made us um, stubborn and strong in what we believe. And I think we're both very confident people that, uh, that are authentic and aren't trying to put on a show. I don't think there's anything fake about either one of us. We just, we are who we are. Third row on the left. Uh, Dan, what, do you, what is having an enormous backcourt like you have and like you had last year what strategic advantage does that give you, particularly against a smaller backcourt like Purdue has? Yeah, just the size of guards. Just to, you know, to have a, a, a six-five Tristan Newton, um, you know, Steph Castle who's six-six, to be able to put him on on a point guard um, or on a wing scorer, either one of those guys. It just affects passing windows, uh, I think, for guards, whether it's the ball screen game or post feeding. Um, Obviously, it shrinks the court for the opponent as well. Um, allows you to contest the three-point line at those spots. Um, and even Caravan, who's you know six eight, six nine, uh, but he's got really, really, you know, uh, he's got great length at, at his position uh, as well. UConn locker room is now open, and breakouts are beginning with players. We'll continue with coach. Question from Wayne Norman, all the way on the right. Hi, Dan. Up, You're man? a very good three-point shooting team, and Donovan Klingon plays a big role in that. Purdue is the second-best three-point shooting team in the country. Is it a similar formula with Edie in the middle to open their three-point shooters? Yeah, you got to pick. Um, you know, you got to pick your poison. Uh, I think you got to mix things up. Um, you know, single coverage for Zach Edie is uh, it's a scary proposition, um, even with Donovan, because. You know he's a, he, he's a game changer, uh, you know, for us at, at both ends of the court um, and on the backboard. So I just think that we, you know we, we can't give them one look. You know they're they're, they're too good. Um, and in a lot of ways, we just we mirror each other. You know they're two or three in offense in the country, and they're twelfth in defense. Um, there's just not a lot of holes in, in either team. It's NBA level talent up and down each roster. Um, and, and teams that are just well-rounded without a lot of vulnerabilities. We're going to go to Matt, then Brendan, then Billy, and then my guess is we're going to have to wrap this up. Let's get a microphone for Matt. He's got the blue shirt right there holding his arm out. He has a microphone. Matt Norlander, CBS Sports. I'm going to ask you to extend that thought because um, Edie is combining for close to about 44 points and rebounds a game. Uh, are you anticipating the necessity to double team him some, or are you, as a competitor, Dan, and how you're going to prepare for this, are you preparing for Edie to just go Edie again, and then whatever we can do to shut everyone else down, we're just going to win that way? Obviously, other teams have tried that approach. Most have failed when they face Purdue. Yeah. Um, it's a unique challenge. Um, he's a unique player. I don't think that, that one thing is going to work in the game. I, I think you've got to... 
uh, you know, try to try to keep him uh, off balance. You know, Matt, unfortunately for us, you know, really constructed a great roster around such a unique player. Um, obviously, the you know the blind spot for them last year was you know was subpar three point shooting, which allowed you to to surround him. Um, whereas now, if you put two on the ball with him, um, you're now turning loose a team that's shooting 40 percent from three. Um, if you single coverage him, even in, with Donovan, a player of his caliber, he obviously gets fouled a lot or he's at the free throw line a lot. Um, so now we're putting maybe our most impactful player in position to maybe get in foul trouble, uh, you know, which would cause big problems for us at both ends and on the backboard. I just think that um, even though it's a short prep, we've played a lot of games this year. And... Um, you know, I think there's, there's a number of different things we're going to have to try to do and, and mix up and see what's effective. Brennan. Dan, uh, Brennan Quinn from The Athletic. When you deal with alums of a certain era, um, you know, dudes who played in the Yankee Conference and stuff, <laughs> like, wh what's been your experience like seeing them process what this place has become? Uh, the... Um, you know, I'd, I'd say U UConn's unique because uh, I mean we, we've got um, we're, we're UConn's the pro sports franchise of the state, um, and uh, obviously it, it, it's two things: the the impact that basketball at UConn has had on the university and, and the growth of the university and what it was like in the '80s and '90s, the small agricultural college that. Uh, you know, you, you, I think when I drove through campus in the early to mid '90s, I, I thought I, I missed the campus, and, uh, and as I arrived at Gamble, so the explosion of basketball, what it's meant to the state, what it's meant to, uh, you know, the, you know, the campus becoming a world class university, the impact has been great, um, and it, it's, uh, you know, what 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 D Rowe and and Coach Calhoun and Gino. Um, and, and the former players that want to be around, and not just for the Final Four or when the cameras are around, but the, uh, the amount of folks that come through to watch a practice, to talk to the boys. Um, you know, it's, it's a unique relationship, special. We'll wrap things up with Billy. Uh, Billy Witz with the New York Times. Dan, this era with, there's, so much, um, you know, with conference realignment and the portal and NIL, it it feels like it should be harder to win back-to-back -back championships, which is obviously, as history's proven, is rare to, to begin with. What is it, I, I wonder if you can identify a couple things that maybe about your program that have uh, allowed you to be in this position. Yeah, I think um, we, we, we're at, at this point, I think, um, you know, we, we understand that we could, as Teddy Atlas would say, like, you know, pass on uh, some of the neon talents, uh, you know, to, to get our type of people. Um, obviously, there's, you know, there, there's, a, there's a baseline that you need in terms of size, athletic ability, you know, just ability with the basketball to, to do things. But we really hold out uh, to, to get our type of people. Um, the staff continuity, you know, we've made it. You know, so so good. I think um, for guys like Kamani and Luke um, to to not take a low or, or mid major jobs. Uh, so I've been able to keep my staff intact. Um, you know, by by making sure they're they're taken care of. Um, you know, that way. But we we just haven't changed a lot. You know, like I, I you know, we we don't kiss the kids. Uh, you know, ass during the recruiting. We don't kiss it while they're on campus. Um, you know, we, we bring tremendous value to our players because we're old school and we push them to get better and to become better people and we teach them what it, you know, how to become successful. I just, you know, I, I think we, we, we truly have, I think we try to play modern basketball with the use of analytics as I bought more into that, but have really held on to like old school values the way, you know, coaches, you know, maybe used to be more. Uh, where um, you know we're in charge, <laughs> and um, and we hold people accountable, but we we play a modern style of ball.
We want to thank Coach Hurley for joining us here in the main interview room. Thank you, Coach. Good luck tomorrow. Thank you, guys. See you. UConn student athletes are available in the breakout areas and also in the locker room until 235.